Okay, so Dysrhythmias, chapter 35, and this is going to be a long one. Your ability to recognize normal and abnormal heart rhythms is called dysrhythmias. It is an essential nursing skill. Prompt assessment of dysrhythmias and the patient's response to the rhythm is critical. Four properties of heart cells allow the conduction system to start an electrical impulse. Send it through the heart tissue and stimulate muscle contraction. Automaticity is the ability to initiate an impulse spontaneously and con con continuously. Excitability is the ability to be electrically stimulated. Conductivity is the ability to transmit an impulse along the membrane in an orderly manner. Contractility is the ability to respond mechanically to an impulse. The conduction system of the heart consists of specialized neuromuscular tissue located throughout the heart. The above figure depicts the conduction system of the heart. A normal impulse starts at the SA node in the upper right atrium near the entrance of the vena cava. It spreads over the atrial myocardium via the intraatrial pathways and the internodal pathways, causing atrial contraction. The impulse then travels to the AV node through the bundle of his and down the left and right bundle branches, it ends in the progenky fibers, which transmit the impulse to the ventricles. The autonomic nervous system plays an important role in the rate of impulse formation, speed of conduction, and strength of cardiac contraction. The components of the autonomic nervous system that affect the heart are the vagus nerve fibers of the parasympathetic nervous system and the nerve fibers of the sympathetic nervous system. Stimulation of the vagus nerve causes a decreased rate of firing of the SA node and slowed impulse conduction of the AV node. Stimulation of the sympathetic nerve increases SA node firing AV node impulse conduction and cardiac contractility. Dysrhythmias result from disorders of impulse form formation, conduction of impulses, or both. The heart has specialized cell in the SA node, atria, AV node, uh, and bundle of his, and the progenky fibers, which can fire or discharge spontaneously. Normally, the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. It spontaneously fires 60 to 100 times per minute. A secondary pacemaker from another site may fire in two ways. If the SA node fires more slowly than a secondary pacemaker, the electrical pacemaker will then fire automatically at its intrinsic rate. These secondary pa pacemakers may start from the AV node at the rate of 40 to 60 times per minute or the progenky fibers at a rate of 20 to 40 times per minute. Another way the secondary pacemakers can start is when they fire more rapidly than the normal pacemaker of the SA node. Triggered beats, so early or late, may, can, may come from an ectopic focus or an accessory pathway, so an area that's outside of the n normal conduction pathway in either the atria, AV node, or ventricles. This results in a dysrhythmia, which replaces the normal sinus rhythm. The electrocardiogram is a graphic tracing of electrical impulses produced in the heart. The waveforms on the EKG, or ECG, represent electrical activity pr produced by the movement of ions across the membranes of heart cells representing depolarization and repolarization. The inside of the cell when at rest or in the polarized state is negative compared with the outside. When a cell or groups of cells are stimulated, the cell membrane changes its permeability. This allows sodium to move rapidly into the cell, making the inside of the cell positive compared with the outside, which is depolarization. A slower movement of ions across the membra membrane restores the cell to the polarized state, called repolarization. The P wave represents time for the passage of electrical impulses through the atrium 
causing atrial depolarization, that's contraction. The PR interval is measured from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. It represents the time taken for the impulse to spread through the atria, AV node, and bundle of his. The bundle branches and the projinky fibers to point immediately preceding ventricular contraction. The QRX complex consists of three distinct waves. The Q wave is the first negative downward deflection after the P wave, short and narrow and not present in several leads. The R wave is the first positive or upward deflection in the QRS complex and the S wave is the first negative downward deflection of the, after the R wave. The QRS interval is measured from the beginning to the end of the QRS complex. It represents the time taken for depolarization, contraction of both ventricles. The ST segment is measured from the S wave of the QRS complex to the beginning of the T wave. It represents the time between ventricular depolarization and repolarization. It should be isoelectric or flat. The T wave represents the time for ventricular repolarization. It should be upright. The QT interval is measured from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. It represents the time taken for entire electrical depolarization and repolarization of the ventricles. Typically, an ECG consists of 12 leads. Leads, once again, is another name for view of the heart's activity. A lead consists of positive and negative electrode, with the positive electrode being the seeing eye. Activity coming toward the positive electrode produces upward deflection on the EKG paper, and one going away from the seeing eye produces a downward deflection. This is the reason for lead tracings looking different. Six of the leads measure electrical forces in the frontal plane. These are bipolar, positive and negative, leads one, two, and three. And unipolar positive leads are AVR, AVL and AVF. The remaining six unipolar leads, V1 through V6, measure the electrical forces in the horizontal plane. The 12 lead ECG may show changes suggesting structural, structural changes, conduction disturbances, damage like ischemia or infarction, electrolyte imbalance or drug toxicity. Obtaining 12 e 12 ECG views of the heart is also helpful in the assessment of dysrhythmias. <clears throat> Accurate interpretation of ECG depends on the correct placement of the leads on a patient. So in figure one you have your limb leads one, two, and three. Leads are located on the extremities. Um, figure number B, lead placement for limb leads AVR, AVL, and AVF. These unipolar leads use the center of the heart as their negative electrode. And then C, lead placement for the chest electrodes V1, fourth intercostal space at right sternal border V2, fourth intercostal space at the left sternal border V3, halfway between V2 and V4. And V4, uh, fifth intercostal space at the left midclavicular line. And V5, fifth intercostal space at the anterior axillary line. V6 is the fifth intercostal space at the mid axillary line. One or more ECG leads can be used to continuously monitor a patient's ECG. The leads most commonly selected are leads 2 and V1. MCL1 is class is modified chest lead that is similar to V1 and is used when only three leads are available for monitoring. Lead placement for MCL using the three lead system in figure A. 
figure B lead placement for V1 to V6 using a 5 lead system, and figure C The monitor continuously displays the heart rhythm ECG paper attached to the monitor records the ECG or the rhythm strip. This provides a record of the patient's rhythm. It also allows for measurement of complexes and intervals and assessment of dysrhythmias. To correctly interpret an ECG, measure time and voltage on the ECG paper. ECG paper consists of large heavy lines and small light lines in squares. Each large square consists of 25 smaller squares, five horizontal and five vertical. Horizontally, each small square represents 0.04 seconds. This means that one large square equals 0.20 seconds, and that 300 large squares equal one minute. Vertically, each small square represents 0.1 millivolt. This means that one large square equals 0.5 millivolts. Use these squares to calculate the heart rate and measure time intervals for the different ECG complexes. You can use a variety of methods to calculate heart rate from an ECG. The most accurate way is to count the number of QRS complexes in one minute. However, because the method is time consuming, a simpler process is used. Note that every three seconds, a marker appears on the ECG paper. Count the number of R to R intervals in six seconds and multiply that number by 10. An R wave is the first upward or positive wave in the QRS complex. This is an estimated number of beats per minute. Another method is to count the number of small squares between one R to R interval. Divide this number into 1500 to get your heart rate. Last, you can count the number of large squares between one R to R interval and divide this number into 300 to get the heart rate. All these methods are most accurate when the rhythm is regular. When the rhythm is regular, heart rate can be determined at a glance. The estimated heart rate here is, that's right, 70. ECG leads consist of electro pad fixed with electrical conductive gel. Before placing these on a patient, you must properly prepare the skin. You're going to clip excessive hair in the chest with scissors. Gently rub the skin with dry gauze until slightly pink. If the skin is oily, wipe with alcohol first. If the patient is diaphoretic, apply a skin protectant before placing the electrode. You will see artifact on the monitor when leads and electrodes are not secure, or if there is muscle activity, shivering, or electrical interference. Artifact is a distortion of the baseline and waveform seen on the ECG. Accurate interpretation of cardiac rhythm is difficult when artifact is present. If artifact occurs, check the connections in the equipment. You may need to replace the electrodes if the conductive gel has dried out. Telemont uh, telemetry monitoring is the observation of a patient's heart rate and rhythm at a site distant from the patient. Two types of systems are used for telemetry monitoring. The first type is centra centralized monitoring system, requires you or a telemetry technician to continuously observe a group of patients' ECGs at a central location. The second system of telemetry monitoring does not require constant surveillance. These systems have the capability of detecting and storing data. Advanced alarm systems provide different levels of detection of dysrhythmias ischemia or infarction. Computerized monitoring systems are not fail-proof. Frequently assess all monitored patients for any signs 
of hemodynamic instability. When assessing the heart rhythm, make an accurate interpretation and immediately assess the clinical status of the patient. Assess the patient's hemodynamic response to any change in rhythm. This information will guide the selection of your interventions. Determine nation of the cause of the dysrhythmias is a priority. For example, tachycardias may be the result of fever and may cause a decrease in cardiac output and hypotension. Electrolyte disturbances can cause dysrhythmias and, if not treated, can lead to life-threatening dysrhythmias. At all times, assess and treat the patient, not the monitor, when a dysrhythmia is noted. When assessing a cardiac rhythm, use, use a consistent and systematic approach. One such approach includes the following. First step, look at the presence of the P wave. Is it upright or inverted? Is there one for every QRS complex or more than one? Are there arterial fibrillatory or flutter waves present? Step two. Evaluate the atrial rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? Three, calculate the atrial rate. Four, measure the duration of the PR interval. Is it normal duration or prolonged? Five, evaluate the ventricular rhythm. Is it regular or ir irregular? Six, calculate the ventricular rate. Seven, measure the duration of the QRS complex. Is it normal duration or prolonged? Eight, assess the ST segment. Is it isoelectric or flat? Is it elevated or is it depressed? Nine, measure the duration of the QT interval. Is it normal duration or prolonged? 10, note the T wave. Is it upright or inverted? Some additional questions to consider. Uh, what is the dominant or underlying rhythm and or dysrhythmia? What is the clinical significance of your findings? And what is the treatment for that particular rhythm? Normal sinus rhythm refers to a rhythm that starts in the SA node at a rate of 60 to 100 times per minute and follows the normal conduction pathway. Rhythm is regular. The P wave perceives precedes each QRS complex and has normal shape and duration. The PR interval is normal and the QRS complex has normal shape and duration. Sinus bradycardia. The conduction pathway is the same as sinus rhythm, but the SA node fires at a rate less than 60 beats per minute. The rhythm is regular. The P wave perceives the QRS complex and has normal shape and duration. The PR interval is normal and the QRS complex has normal shape and duration. Sinus bradycardia may be normal sinus rhythm in aerobically trained athletes and in some people during sleep. It also occurs in response to carotid sinus massage, hypothermia, increased intraocular pressure, vagal stimulation, and certain drugs like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Common disease states associated with sinus bradycardia are hypothyroidism, increased intracranial pressure, and inferior myocardial infarction. The clinical significance of sinus bradycardia depends on how the patient tolerates it. Symptomatic bradycardia refers to a heart rate less than 60 beats per minute and is inadequate for the patient's condition. This causes the patient to experience symptoms like fatigue, dizziness, chest pain, and syncope. Signs of symptomatic bradycardia can include pale, cool skin, hypotension, weakness, angina, dizziness or syncope, confusion or disorientation, and shortness of breath. Treatment for sinus bradycardia consists of administration of atropine for patients with symptoms. Pacemaker therapy may be required. If bradycardia is due to drugs, these drugs will need to be held, discontinued, or reduced. 
A patient's cardiac rhythm is sinus bradycardia with a heart rate of 34 beats per minute. If the bradycardia is symptomatic, the nurse would expect the patient to exhibit A. Palpitations, B. Hypertension, C. Warm flushed skin, or D. Shortness of breath. The answer is D. Signs of symptomatic bradycardia include pale, cool skin, hypotension, weakness, angina, dizziness or syncope, confusion or disorientation, and shortness of breath. Sinus tachycardia. The conduction pathway is the same as sinus in sinus tachycardia as normal sinus rhythm. The sinus rate is 101 to 200 beats per minute. The P wave is normal, precedes the QRS complex, and has normal shape and duration. The PR inter interval is normal, and the QRS complex has normal shape and duration. The discharge rate from the sinus node increases because of vagal in inhibition or sympathetic stimulation. Sinus tachycardia is associated with physiologic and psychologic stressors such as exercise, fever, pain, hypotension, hypovolemia, anemia, hypoxia, hypoglycemia, myocardial ischemia, heart failure, hyperthyroidism, anxiety, and fear. It can also be an effect of drugs such as epinephrine, so if you use an EpiPen, norepinephrine or levofed, atropine, caffeine, theophylline or hydrolyzine. In addition, many of the over-the-counter over -counter cold remedies have active ingredients like Sudafed that can cause tachycardia. Uh, the clinical significance of sinus tachycardia depends on the patient's tolerance of the increased heart rate. The patient may have dizziness, difficulty breathing, and hypotension due to decreased cardiac output. Increased myocardial oxygen consumption is associated with an increased heart rate. Angina or an increase in infarction size may accompany sinus tachycardia in patients with coronary artery disease or in an acute MI. The underlying, the underlying cause of tachycardia guidelines guides the treatment. For example, for patients who are experiencing tachycardia from pain, effective pain management is important to treat the tachycardia. In patients who are clinically stable, vagal maneuvers can be attempted. In addition, beta blockers like metoprolol can be given to reduce heart rate and decrease myocardial oxygen consumption. Heart rate varies with the underlying rate and frequency of the PAC. The rhythm is irregular. The P wave has different shape from that of the P wave originally originating from the SA node, or it may be hidden in the preceding T wave. The PR interval may be short or longer than the PR interval coming from the SA node, but it is within normal limits. The QRS complex is usually normal. If the QRS interval is greater than or equal to 0 0.12 seconds, um, abnormal conduction through the ventricles is present. A premature atrial contraction or a PAC is the contraction starting from the ectopic focus in the atrium and coming sooner than the next expected sinus beat. The ectopic signal starts in the left or right atrium and travels across the atria by the abnormal pathway. This creates a distorted P wave. At the AV node, it may be stopped, delayed, or conducted normally. If the signal, signal moves through the AV node, in most cases, it's conducted normally through the ventricles. In a normal heart, a PAC can result from emotional stress or physical fatigue, or from the use of caffeine, tobacco, or alcohol. A PAC can also result from hypoxia, electrolyte imbalances, and disease states such as hyperthyroidism, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and heart disease, including CAD and valvular disease. In persons with healthy hearts, 
isolated PACs are not significant. Patients may report palpations or a sense that their hearts skipped a beat. In persons with heart disease, frequent PACs may indicate enhanced automaticity of the atria or re-entry mechanism. Such PACs may warn of, of or start more serious dysrhythmias like supraventricular tachycardia. Treatment depends on the patient's symptoms. Withdrawal of sources of stimulation such as caffeine or certain drugs may be needed. Beta blockers may be used to decrease PACs. PSVT is a dysrhythmia starting in an ectopic focus anywhere above the bifurcation of the bundle of his. Identification of the ectopic fo focus is often difficult, even with a 12-lead ECG, and requires recording the dysrhythmia as it starts. The heart rate is 150 to 220 beats per minute, and the rhythm is regular or slightly irregular. The P wave is often hitted in the preceding T wave. If seen, it may have an abnormal shape. The PR interval may be shortened or normal, and the QRS complex is usually normal. PSVT occurs because of re-entrant phenomena, so the re-excitation of the atria when there is a one-way block. Usually, PAC triggers a run of repeated premature beats. In a normal heart, PSVT is associated with overexertion, emotional stress, um, deep inspiration, and stimulants, so, stimulants such as caffeine and tobacco. PSVT is, associate, is also associated with rheumatic heart disease, digitalis toxicity, CAD, or co-pulmonale. The clinical significance of PSVT depends on the associated symptoms. A prolonged episode and heart rate greater than 180 beats per minute will cause decreased cardiac output due to reduced stroke volume. Manifestations include hypotension, difficulty breathing, and in angina. Treatment of PSVT includes vagal stimulation and drug therapy. Common vagal maneuvers including valsalva, carotid massage, and coughing. IV adenosine is the first drug of choice to convert PSVT to normal sinus rhythm. This drug has a short half-life of just 10 seconds and is well tolerated by most patients. IV beta blockers like sodalol, calcium channel blockers like diltiazem, and amiodarone can also be used. If vagal stimulation and drug therapy are ineffective and the patient becomes hemodyna hemodynamically unstable, direct current cardioversion is used. A flutter is an atrial tachycardi tachy dysrhythmia identified by recurring regular sawtooth shaped flutter waves that originate from a single ectopic focus in the right atrium or less commonly the left atrium. Atrial rate is 200 to 350 beats per minute. The ventricular rate will vary based on the conduction ratio. In a 2 to 1 conduction, the ventricular rate is typically found to be approximately 150 beats per minute. Atrial rhythm is regular and ventricular rhythm is usually regular. The PR interval is variable and not measurable. The QRS complex is usually normal because the AV node can delay signals from the atria. There is usually some AV block and fixed ratio of flutter waves to QRS complexes. Atrial flutter rarely occurs in a healthy heart. It is associated with CAD, hypertension, mitral valve disorders, pulmonary embolus, chronic lung disease, core pulmonale, um, cardiomyopathy, hyperthyroidism, and the use of drugs such as 
digoxin, quinidine, and epinephrine. The high ventricular rates, greater than 100 beats per minute, and loss of the atrial kick, so atrial contraction reflected by a sinus P wave, that are associated with atrial flutter, decrease cardiac output. This can cause serious consequences such as heart failure, especially in the patient with underlying heart disease. Patients with atrial flutter have an increased rate of stroke because of the risk of thrombus formation in the atria from the stasis of blood. Warfarin is given to prevent stroke in patients who have atrial flutter. The primary goal in, in treatment of A flutter is to slow the ventricular response by increasing AV block. Drug used to control ventricular rate include calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Antidysrhythmia drugs are used to convert A flutter to sinus rhythm, um, something like Corvert, or to maintain sinus rhythm like amiodarone. Electrical conversion may be performed to convert the A flutter to sinus rhythm in an emergency. Radiofrequency catheter ablation is treatment of choice for A flutter. The procedure is done in the EP laboratory and involves placing a catheter in the right atrium using a low voltage, high frequency form of electrical energy. The ectopic foci are ablated or destroyed. The dysrhythmia is ended and normal sinus rhythm is restored. AFib is characterized by a total disorganization of a atrial electrical activity due to multiple ectopic foci resulting in loss of effective atrial contraction. During AFib, the atrial rate may be as high as 350 to 600 beats per minute. P waves are replaced by chaotic fibrillatory waves. Ventricular rate varies and the rhythm is usually irregular. When the ventricular rate is between 60 to 100 beats a minute, it is AFib with a controlled ventricular response. AFib with a ventricular rate greater than 100 beats per minute is AFib with rapid ventricular response. The PR interval is not measurable and the QRS complex usually has a, sh a normal shape and duration. At times, a flutter and a fib may coexist. This uh, dysrhythmia may begin or end spontaneously or be persistent. A fib is the most common clinically significant dysrhythmia with respect to morbidity and mortality rates and econ economic impact. Its prevalence increases with age. AFib usually occurs in a patient with underlying heart disease, such as CAD, rheumatic heart disease, cardiomyopathy, hypertensive heart disease, heart failure, and pericarditis. It often develops acutely. Um, alcohol intoxication, caffeine use, electrolyte disturbances, stress, and heart surgery. AFib results in a decrease in cardiac output because of ineffective atrial contractions. So once again, we've lost that atrial kick and or rapid ventricular response. Thrombi or clots form in the atria because of the blood stasis. An embolized clot may develop and pass to the brain causing stroke. AFib accounts for as many as 17% of all strokes. The goals of treatment for AFib include a decrease in ventricular response to less than 100 beats per minute, prevention of stroke, and conversion to sinus rhythm if possible. Ventricular rate control is a priority for patients with AFib. Drugs used for rate control include cal calcium channel blockers like diltiazem, beta blockers like metoprolol, digoxin, and 
um, amiodarone. For some patients, drug or electrical conversion of atrial fibrillation to normal sinus rhythm may be considered. The most common antidysrhythmia drugs used for conversion to and maintenance of sinus rhythm include amiodarone and abutilide. Electrical cardioversion may convert AFib to a normal sinus rhythm. If a patient is in AFib for longer than 48 hours, anticoagulant coagulation therapy with warfarin is needed for three to four weeks before the cardioversion and for several weeks after successful cardioversion. Anticoagulation therapy is necessary because the, preacher, the procedure can cause the clots to dislodge. This places the patient at risk for stroke. A transesophageal electro echocardiogram may be performed to rule out the presence of clots in the atria. If no clots are present, anticoagulation therapy may, be, may not be needed before the cardioversion. If drugs or cardioversion do not convert the AFib to normal sinus rhythm, long-term anticoagulation therapy is needed. Warfarin is the drug of choice in patients monitored for therapeutic levels. So we have to make sure we're monitoring their INR. For patients with drug refractory AFib or who do not respond to electrical car, um, conversion and remain symptomatic, radiofrequency catheter ablation, similar to the procedure for A flutter, and the maze procedure are further options. The maze procedure is a surgical intervention that stops AFib by interrupting the ectopic foci that are responsible for the dysrhythmia. Incisions are made in both atria and cryoablation, cold therapy, is used to stop the formation and conduction of these signals and restore normal, normal sinus rhythms. Junctional dysrhythmias refer to the dysrhythmias that start in the area of the AV node to the bundle of his known as the AV junction. They result because the SA node fails to fire or signal is blocked. When this occurs, the AV node becomes the pacemaker of the heart. The impulse from the AV node usually moves in a retrograde or backward fashion. This, per this produces a an abnormal P wave that occurs just before or after the QRS complex or that is hidden in the QRS complex. The impulse usually moves normally through the ventricles. Junct junctional dysrhythmias are often associated with CAD, HF, cardiomyopathy, electrical Im imbalances, inferior MI, and rheumatic heart disease. Certain drugs, dig digoxin, Amphetamines, caffeine, and nicotine can also cause junctional dysrhythmias. Junctional dysrhythmias include junctional escape rhythm, as shown on this slide, accelerated junctional rhythm, and junctional tachycardia. In junctional escape rhythm, the heart rate is 40 to 60 beats per minute. It is 61 to 100 beats in accelerated and 100 to 180 beats in junctional tachycardia. Rhythm is regular. The P wave is abnormal in shape and inverted or it may be hidden in the QRS complex. The PR interval is less than 0.12 seconds and the P wave precedes the QRS complex. The QRS complex is usually normal. Junctional premature beats may occur and they are treated in a manner similar to that for PACs. Junctional escape rhythms serve as safety mechanism occurring when the SA node has not been effective. Escape rhythms such as this should not be suppressed. Accelerated junctional rhythm is due to sympathetic stimulation to improve cardiac output. Junctional tachycardia indicates a more serious problem. This rhythm may result in a reduction of cardiac output, causing the patient to become hemodynamically unstable, for example, hypotensive. Treatment varies according to the type of junctional dysrhythmia. If a patient has symptoms with junctional escape rhythm, atropine can be used, 
an accelerated and junctional tachycardia caused by drug toxicity. The drug is stopped. In the absence of digitalis toxicity, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and amiodarone are used for rate control. Cardioversion should not be used. First degree AV block is a type of AV block in which every impulse is conducted to the ventricles, but the time of AV conduction is prolonged. After the impulse moves through the AV node, the ventricles usually respond normally. Heart rate is normal and rhythm is regular. The P wave is normal. The PR interval is prolonged greater than 0.20 seconds. And the QRS complex usually has a normal shape and duration. First degree AV block is associated with MICAD, rheumatic fever, hyperthyroidism, electrolyte balances, particularly hypokalemia, vagal stimulation, and drugs such as digoxin, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and fleconate. Uh, first degree AV block is usually not serious but can be a sign of a higher degrees of AV block. Patients with first degree AV block are asymptomatic. There is no treatment for first degree AV block. Changes to potentially causative situations may be considered. considered. Monitor patients for any new changes in heart rhythm. For example, anything um, leading to a more serious AV block. Type 1 second degree AV block, this is Mobitz 1 or Winky Bach, includes a gradual lengthening of the PR interval. It occurs because of a prolonged AV conduction time until an atrial impulse or non-conducted and a QRS complex is blocked or missing. Atrial rate is regular, but ventricular rate may be slower because of non-conducted or blocked QRS complexes resulting in bradycardia. One, once a ventricular beat is blocked, the cycle repeats itself with progressive lengthening of the PR intervals until another QRS complex is blocked. The rhythm appears on the ECG in a pattern of grouped beats. Ventricular rhythm is irregular or irregular. The P wave has a normal shape. The QRS complex is, has a normal shape and duration. Uh, type 1 AV block may result from drugs such as digoxin or beta blockers. It may also be associated with key, uh, CAD and other diseases that can slow AV conduction. It's usually a result of myocardial ischemia or inferior MI. It is generally transient and well tolerated. However, in some patients, those with acute MI, it may be a warning sign of a more serious AV conduction disturbance, something like a complete heart block. If the patient is symptomatic, atropine is used to increase the heart rate or temporary pacemaker may be needed, especially if the heart has experienced an MI. If the patient is asymptomatic, the rhythm is closely observed with transcutaneous pacemaker on standby. Type 2, second degree AV block, Mobitz 2. A P wave is non-conductant without progressive PR lengthening. This usually occurs when a block in one of the bundle branches is present. On conductive beats, the PR interval is con constant. Atrial rate is usually normal. Ventricular rate depends on the degree of AV block. Atrial rhythm is regular, but ventricular rhythm is maybe irregular. The P wave has a normal shape. The PR interval may be normal or, or prolonged in duration and remains constant on conducted beats. The QRS complex is usually greater than 0.12 seconds because of the bundle branch block. Type 2 AV block is associated with rheumatic heart disease, CAD, anterior MI, and drug toxicity. Type 2 um, often progresses to third degree AV block and is associated with poor prognosis. The reduced heart wave rate frequently results in decreased cardiac output with subsequent hypotension and myocardial ischemia. 
Type 2 block is indication for therapy with permanent pacemaker. Transcutaneous pacing or insertion of a temporary pacemaker may be necessary. Before the insertion of a permanent pacemaker, if the patient becomes symptomatic, so if they get hypotensive or they experience some chest pain. Atropine is not an effective drug to use for this dysrhythmia. Third degree block or complete heart block constitutes one form of AV dissociation in which no impulses from the atria are conducted to the ventricles. The atria are stimulated and contract independently of the ventricles. The ventricular rhythm is an escape rhythm and the ectopic pacemaker may be above or below the bifurcation of the bundle of his. The atrial rate is usually a sinus rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. The ventricular rate depends on the site of the block. If it is in the AV node, the rate is 40 to 60 beats per minute. If it is in the Purjinki system, it is 20 to 40 beats per minute. Atrial and ventricular rhythms are regular but unrelated to each other. The P wave has a normal shape, the PR interval is variable, and there is no relationship between the P wave and the QRS complex. The QRS complex is normal if an escape rhythm is, is initiated at the bundle of his or above. It is widened if the escape rhythm is initiated below the bundle of his. Third degree AV block is associated with severe heart disease, including CAD, MI, myocarditis, um, cardiomyopathy, and some systemic diseases such as um, scleroderma. Some drugs can also cause third degree AV block, such as digoxin, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers. Third degree AV block usually results in reduced cardiac output with subsequent ischemia. Uh, heart failure and shock. Syncope from third degree AV block may result from severe bradycardia or even periods of asystole. For symptomatic patients, a transcutaneous pacemaker is used until temporary transvenous pacemaker can be inserted. The use of drugs such as dopamine and epinephrine is a temporary measure to increase heart rate and support blood pressure until temporary pacing is started. Patients will need a permanent pacemaker as soon as possible. Atropine is not an effective drug for this dysrhythmia. PVCs. Uh, PVC is a contraction coming from the ectopic fo focus in the ventricles. It is premature or early occurrence of the QRS complex. A PVC is wide and distorted in shape compared to the QRS complex coming down the normal conduction pathway. PVCs that arise from different foci appear different in shape from each other and are called multifocal PVCs. PVCs that have the same shape are called unifocal PVCs. When every other beat is a PVC, the rhythm is called ventricular bigeminy. When every third beat is a PVC, it is called ventricular trigeminy. Two consecutive PCs are called a couplet. Ventricular tachycardia occurs when there are three or more consecutive PVCs. From the R on the T phenomenon, the R on the T phenomenon occurs when the PVC falls on the T wave of the preceding beat. This is especially dangerous because the PVC is firing during the relative refractory phase of ventricular repolarization. Excitability of the heart cells increases during this time and the risk for the PVC to start ventricular tachycardia or VFib is great. Heart rate varies according to intrinsic rate and the number of P PVCs. Rhythm is ir irregular because of the premature beats. The P wave is rarely visible and is usually lost in the QRS complex of the PVC. Retrograde conduction may occur and the P wave may be seen following the ectopic beat. The PR interval is not measurable. The QRS complex is wide and distorted in shape, lasting more than 0.12 seconds. The T wave is generally large and opposite in direction to the major direction of the QRS complex.
PVCs are associated with stimulants like caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, epinephrine, digoxin. They are also associated with electrolyte imbalances, hypoxia, fever, exercise, and emotional stress. Disease states associated with PVCs include MI, mitral valve prolapse, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, and CAD. PVCs are usually not harmful in a patient with a normal heart. In heart disease, disease, PVCs may reduce the cardiac output and lead to angina and heart failure depending on the frequency. Because PVCs and CAD or acute MI indicate ventricular irritability, assess the patient's physiological response to PVCs. Obtain the patient's apical and radial pulse rate as PVCs often do not generate a sufficient ventricular contraction to result in peripheral pulse. This can lead to pulse deficit. There you go, guys. Treatment relates to the cause of PVCs. Oxygen therapy for hypoxia, electrolyte replacement, assessment of the patient's hemodynamic statement status, excuse me, is important to determine whether the treatment with drug therapy is needed. Drug therapy includes beta blockers or amiodarone. A patient has a diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction and has cardiac rhythm is sinus bradycardia with six to eight premature ventricular contractions per minute. The pattern that the nurse recognizes as the most characteristic of PVCs is A, an irregular rhythm, B, an inverted T wave, C, a wide distorted QRS complex, or D, an increasing long PR interval. This answer is going to be C. Premature ventricular contractions have wide and distorted QRS complexes. On to VTAC. A run of three or more PVCs defines a ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular rate is 150 beats to 250 beats per minute. Rhythm may be regular or irregular. AV disassociation may be present with P waves occurring independently of the QRS complex. The atria may be depolarized by the ventricles in a retrograde fashion. The P wave is usually buried in the QRS complex and the PR interval is not measurable. The QRS complex is distorted in appearance and wide, so it's greater than 0.12 seconds. The T wave is opposite direction of the QRS, QRS complex. Ventricular tachycardia occurs when the ectopic focus uh, fire rapidly and the ventricle takes, contr takes control as the pacemaker. Different forms of VTAC exist depending on the QRS configuration. We have monomorphic, has QRS complexes that are the same in size, uh, shape, and direction. You have polymorphic, uh, when the QRS complexes gradually change back and forth from one shape, size, and direction to another over a series of heartbeats. Uh, VTAC may be sustained longer than 30 seconds or non-sustained in uh, less than 30 seconds. The development of uh, VTAC is an ominous sign. It is life-threatening dysrhythmia because of the decreased cardiac output and possibility of development of VFib which is a lethal dysrhythmia. Torresades de points, uh, so this just is French for twisting of points, is a polymorphic V tack associated with prolonged QT interval of an underlying rhythm.
VTAC is associated with MI, CAD, significant electrolyte imbalances, cardiomyopathy, long QT syndrome, drug toxicity, and central nervous system disorders. This dysrhythmia can be seen in patients who have no evidence of heart disease. VTAC can, VTAC can be stable. Patient has a pulse or unstable. Patient is pulseless. Sustained VTAC causes a severe decrease in cardiac output because of the decreased ventricular diastolic filling times and loss of atrial contraction. This results in hypotension, pulmonary edema, decreased cerebral blood flow, and cardiopulmonary arrest. The dysrhythmia must be treated quickly even if it occurs only briefly and stops abruptly. Episodes may reoccur if prophylactic treatment is not started. Ventricular fibrillation may also develop. Precipitating causes must be identified and treated. Um, VTAC with pulse, hemodynamically stable patient is treated with an antidysrhythmic. If the VTAC is monomorphic and the patient is hemodynamically stable, meaning she, the patient has a pulse and has preserved left ventricular function, IV amiodarone may be used. Uh, there's other IV medications too, not just the amiodarone. If the VTEC is polymorphic with a normal baseline QT interval, any one of the following drugs can be used, a beta adrenergic blocker, amiodarone, um, and, and others. Polymorphic VTEC with prolonged baseline QT interval is treated with IV magnesium, dilantin, anti-tachycardia pacing, uh, and drugs that prolong the QT interval, like Tikasin, should be discontinued. Cardioversion is used if drug therapy is ineffective. VTAC without a pulse is a life-threatening situation and is treated with, in the same manner as VFib. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, rapid defibrillation are the first lines of treatment, followed by administration of vasopressors like uh, epinephrine and antidysrhythmics like amiodarone if defibrillation is unsuccessful. An accelerated an AIVR, an accelerated idioventricular rhythm, can develop when the intrinsic pacemaker becomes less than that of the ventricular ectopic pacemaker. The rate is between 40 to 100 beats per minute, is most commonly associated with acute MI and reperfusion of the myocardium after thrombolytic therapy or percutaneous coronary interventions. It can be seen with digitalis toxi toxicity. In the setting of acute MI, AIVR, is usually self-limiting and well tolerated and it needs no treatment. If the patient becomes symptomatic, hypotensive and has chest pain, atropine can be considered. Temporary pacing may be required. Drugs that suppress ventricular rhythms like amiodarone should not be used as these can terminate the ventricular rhythm and further reduce the heart rate. VFib is a severe derangement of the heart rhythm characterized on an ECG by irregular waveforms of varying shapes and amplitude. This represents the firing of multiple ectopic foci in the ventricle. Mechanically, the ventricle is simply quivering with no effective contraction and consequently no car cardiac output occurs. VFib is a lethal dysrhythmia. Heart rate is not measurable. Rhythm is irregular and chaotic. The P wave is not visible, and the PR interval and the QRS, QRS interval are not measurable. VFib occurs in acute MI, in myocardial ischemia, and in chronic diseases such as heart failure and cardiomyopathy. It may occur during cardiac pacing or cardiac cath procedures because of catheter stimulation of the ventricle. It may also occur with coronary reperfusion after thrombolytic therapy. Other clinical associations are electric shock, hyperkalemia, 
hypoxemia, acidosis, and drug toxicity. VFib results in an unresponsive, pulseless, and apneic state. If not rapidly treated, the patient will die. Treatment consists of immediate initiation of CPR and advanced cardiac life support and the use of defibrillation and definitive drug therapy. There should be no delay in using a defibrillator once available. A patient with coronary care unit develops VFib. The first action of the nurse should take is to A, perform defibrillation, B, initiate cardiopulmonary resuscitation, C, prepare for synchronized cardioversion, or D, administer IV antidiuretic drugs per, per protocol. The answer is going to be B. You're going to start CPR right away. A systole represents the total absence of ventricular electrical activity. Occasionally, P waves are seen. No ventricular contraction occurs because depolarization does not occur. Patients are unresponsive, pulseless, and apneic. Asystole is a lethal dysrhythmia that requires immediate treatment. Always assess the rhythm in more than one lead. The prognosis of the patient with asystole is extremely poor. Asystole is usually a result of advanced heart disease, severe cardiac conduction system disturbance, and end-stage heart failure. Generally, the patient with asystole has end-stage heart disease or has prolonged arrest and cannot be resuscitated. Treatment consists of CPR with initiation of ACLS measures. These include definitive drug therapy with epinephrine and or vasopressin and intubation. Pulseless electrical activity, or PEA, is a situation in which organized electrical activity is seen on the ECG, but there's no mechanical heart activity and the patient has no pulse. Prognosis is poor unless the underlying cause is quickly identified and treated. The most common causes of PEA can be easily remembered by thinking of your H's and your T's. Hypovolemia, hypoxia, metabolic acidosis, hyper, hypokalemia, hypoglycemia, and hyperthermia. The T's are toxins. Cardiac toxins include drug overdose. Cardiac tamponade, thrombosis, tension, pneumothorax, and trauma. Treatment begins with CPR followed by drug therapy, epinephrine, and intubation. Correcting the underlying cause is critical to the prognosis. Sudden cardiac death is discussed in chapter 33, but can result from ventricular tachycardia or VFib. Antidysrhythmia drugs can cause life-threatening dysrhythmias similar to those for which they are given. The concept is termed pro-dysrhythmia. Patients who have severe left ventricular dysfunction are the most susceptible to this concept. Digoxin in class 1A, 1C, and 3 dysrhythmia drugs can cause these reactions. The first several days of drug therapy are the vulnerable period for developing these types of pro-dysrhythmias. For this reason, many oral antidysrhythmial drug regimens are started in a monitored hospital setting. Defibrillation. Defibrillation is the treatment of choice to end VFib and pulseless VTEC. It is the most effective when myocardial cells are not 
anoxic or as asodic. Rapid defib within two minutes is critical to successful patient outcomes. Defib involves the passage of the electrical shock through the heart to depolarize the myocardial cells. The goal is that the following repolarization of the heart cells will allow the SA node to resume the role of the pacemaker. They deliver energy using monophasic or biphasic waveform. Monophasic defib defibrillators uh, deliver energy in one direction, and biphasic um, they deliver in two directions. Biphasic deliver shocks at lower energies and with fewer post-shock ECG dysrhythmias than monophasic. Paddle placement and current flow of mono is figure A. And figure B is um, biphasic. Note that the paddle placement is identical. The difference is in the direction of the current flow. The output is measured in joules or watts per second. The recommended energy for initial socks, shocks in defib depends on the type of defibrillator. Biphasics uh, deliver the first and any successive shocks using 120 to 200 joules. Recommendations for monophasic defibrillators include an initial shock of 360 joules. After the first shock, start CPR immediately beginning with the chest compressions. Life pack contains a monitor, defibrillator, and transcutaneous pacemaker. An AED is a defibrillator that has rhythm detection capability and ability to advise the operator to deliver the shock using hands-free defibrillator pads. Proficiency in the use of an AED is part of basic life support course for healthcare providers. You should be familiar with the operation in, of the type of defibrillator used in your clinical setting. The following general steps are taken for defibrillation. CPR should, should be in progress until the defibrillator is available. Turn the defibrillator on and select the proper, proper energy level. Next, you're going to check to see that the synchronizer switch is turned off. Next, you're going to apply conductive materials, so the defibrillator gel pads to the chest, one to the right of the sternum just below the clavicle and the other to the left of the apex. Then you're going to charge the defibrillator using the button on the defibrillator or the paddles. Next, position the paddles firmly on the chest wall over the conductive material. Next, call and look to see that everyone is all clear to ensure the staff are not touching the patient or the bed at the time of discharge. And then finally, you're just going to deliver the charge by depressing the buttons on both paddles simultaneously. Hands-free multi Multifunctional defibrillator pads are available and are placed on the chest and as described above. You connect the cables from the pads to, to the defibrillator. Charge and discharge the defibrillator using buttons on the defibrillator. It is still essential that you ensure that all your staff are all clear before the defibrillator is discharged. Synchronized cardioversion is the therapy of choice for the patient with ventricular VTAC with a pulse or supraventricular tach tachydysrhythmias, so AFib with a rapid ventricular response. A synchronized circuit in the defibrillator delivers a shock that is programmed to occur on the R wave of the QRS complex of the e ECG. The procedure for synchronized cardioversion is the same as for defibrillation with the following exceptions. The synchronizer switch must be turned on when cardioversion is planned. If synchronized cardioversion is done in a non-emergency basis, the patient is awake and hemodynamically stable. The patient is sedated. Usually they use Versed before the procedure. Strict attention to maintaining the patient's airways, airway is critical. 
Then you're going to start the initial energy for a synchronized cardioversion at 50 to 100 joules for a biphasic defibrillator and 100 joules for a mono, and increase if needed. If the patient becomes pulseless or rhythm changes to V-fib, turn the synchronizer switch off and perform defibrillation. The implantable cardioverter defibrillator, or ICD, is an, as is an important technology for patients who have survived SCD or who have spontaneous sustained VTAC, have syncope with inducible ventricular tachycardia or um, ventricular fibrillation during EPS, and are at high risk for future life-threatening thre life dysrhythmias maybe they have cardiomyopathy. The use of ICDs has significantly decreased heart rate, or excuse me, decreased heart mortality rates in these patients. The ICD consists of a lead system placed via a subclavian vein to the endocardium. A battery powered pulse generator is implanted subcutaneously usually over the pectoral muscle in the patient's non-dominant side. The pulse generator is similar in size to a pacemaker. Most systems are single lead systems. The ICD sensing system monitors the heart rate and rhythm and identifies VTAC or VFib. After the sensing system detects a lethal dysrhythmia, the device delivers 25 joule or less to the patient's heart. If the first shock is unsuccessful, the device recycles and can continue to deliver shocks. This is just a slide showing you what an ICD looks like. In addition to defib defibrillation cap capabilities, ICDs are equipped with anti-tachycardia and anti-bradycardia pacing capabilities. These devices use algori algorithms to detect the dysrhythmias and determine the appropriate response. They can initiate overdrive pacing of supraventricular or ventricular tachycardias, sparing the patient painful defibrillator shocks. They also provide backup pacing for braided dysrhythmias that may occur after defibrillation discharges. Pre-procedure and post-procedure nursing care for patients undergoing ICD placement is similar to care for patients undergoing permanent pacemaker implementation, which is, we're going to discuss that in a few slides. Recent research has focused on a totally subcutaneous ICD. Um, the SICD pulse generator is placed under the skin on the left side of the chest, and the electrode is placed under the skin above the sternum. The system delivers a shock when VTAC or VFib is detected. Since the SICD does not have any electrodes implanted in the heart, it has no pacing capability. Patients experience a variety of emotions. These include fear of body image, fear of re recurrent dysrhythmias, expectation of pain with ICD discharge, um, often described as feeling like a blow to the chest and anxiety about going home. Encourage patients and caregivers to participate in local or online ICD support groups like Facebook. Um, table 35-10 presents a teaching guide for a patient with an ICD and the caregiver. So include the following instructions when teaching management of the ICD. You're going to, number one, follow up with the HCP, the healthcare provider, for routine checks of function of the ICD. This is often done by er interrogating the device using a telephone. Two, report any signs of infection at the incision site, redness, swelling, drainage, or fever to your healthcare provider immediately. Keep the incision dry for four days after insertion or in, as instructed. Three, avoid lifting arm on the ICD side above the shoulder, shoulder until approved. 
Number four, you're going to discuss resuming sexual activity with your health care provider. It is usually safe to resume sexual activity once your incision has healed. Five, avoid driving until cleared by your health care provider. This decision is usually based on ongoing presence of dysrhythmias, the frequency of ICD firings, your overall health, and state laws requiring drivers with ICDs. Six, avoid direct blows to the ICD site. And seven, avoid large magnets and strong electromagnetic fields because these may interfere with the device. You should not have an MRI scan unless the ICD is approved for MRI safe or there is a protocol in place for patient safety during the procedure. More patient teaching. Um, eight, travel is not restricted. Inform security at the airport, train station, or public buildings of the presence of an ICD because it may set off the metal detector. If handheld screening wand is used, it should be not, not be placed directly over the ICD. Manufacturer information may vary regarding the effect of the metal detectors on the function of the ICD. Um, Nine, avoid standing near anti-theft devices in doorways or stores in public buildings. You should walk through them at a normal pace. Ten, if your ICD fires, call your healthcare provider immediately. If your ICD fires and you feel sick, contact EMS system. If your ICD fires more than once, contact EMS. Eleven, you should always obtain and wear a medical alert device at all times. 12. Always carry the ICD identification card and current list of your drugs. 13. Consider joining an ICD support group. And 14. Caregivers should learn cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The artificial cardiac pacemaker is an electronic device used to pace the heart when the normal conduction pathway is damaged. The basic pacing circuit consists of power of a power source, a battery-powered pulse generator with programmable circuitry, one or more pacing leads, and the, and the myocardium. The electrical signal or stimulus travels from the pulse generator through the leads to the wall of the myocardium. The heart muscle is captured and stimulated to contract. Ventricular capture, depolarization, Secondary to signal, the pacemaker spike you see from the pacemaker lead in the right ventricle. Current pacemakers are small, sophisticated, and physiologically precise. They pace the atrium and or one or, one or both of the ventricles. Most pacemakers are demand pacemakers. This means that they sense the heart's electrical activity and fire only when the heart rate drops below a present rate. Demand pacemakers have two distinct features. One is a sensing device that inhibits the pacemaker when the heart rate is inadequate, is adequate, excuse me. And number two, pacing device that triggers the pacemaker when no QRS complex occur within a present time period. In addition to anti-bradycardia pacing, devices now include anti-tachycardia and overdrive pacing. Anti-tachycardia pacing involves the delivery of a stimulus to the ventricle to end tachydysrhythmias, like VTAC. Overdrive pacing involves the pacing of the atrium at rates of 200 to 500 impulses a minute in an, in an attempt to, deter, to terminate atrial tachycardias, like a flutter with rapid ventricular dispon, response. And in this figure is a permanent pacemaker is implanted totally within the body. Cardiac resynchronization therapy, so this is called CRT, is a pacing technique that resynchronizes the heart cycle by by pacing both ventricles. So by by ventricular pacing. This promotes improvement in ventricular function. Most heart failure patients have intraventricular conduction delays, causing abnormal ventricular contraction. This causes 
dyssynchrony between the right and left ventricles and results in reduced systolic function, pump insufficiency, and worsened heart failure. For patients with severe left ventricular dysfunction, CRT is combined with implantable cardioverter defibrillator, so an ICD for maximum therapy. A temporary pacemaker is one that has a power source outside the body. There are three types of temporary pacemakers, transvenous, epicardial, and trans transcutaneous. A transvenous pacemaker consists of a lead or leads that are threaded transvenously to the right atrium and or the right ventricle and attached to the external power source. Most temporary transvenous pacemakers are inserted in emergency departments and critical care units in emergency situations. They provide a bridge to insertion of permanent pacemaker or until the underlying cause of the dysrhythmia is resolved. Epicardial pacing involves attaching an atrial and ventricular pacing lead to the epicardium during heart surgery. The leads are passed through the chest wall and attached to the external power source. Epicardial pacing leads are placed prophylactically in case any braided dysrhythmias or tachydysrhythmias occur in early postoperative period. Transcutaneous pacemaker, or TCP, is used to provide adequate heart rhythm and heart rate and rhythm to a patient <clears throat> in an emergency situation. <clears throat> P placement of a TCP is non-invasive, temporary procedure used until a transvenous pacemaker is inserted or until more definitive therapy is available. Before starting TCP therapy, it's important, important to tell the patient what to expect. Explain that the muscle contractions created by the pacemaker when the current passes through the chest wall are uncomfortable. Reassure the patient that the TCP is temporary and that it will be replaced with a transvenous pacemaker as soon as possible. Whenever possible, provide pain medication and or sedation while the TCP is in use. <clears throat> the TCP consists of a power source and a rate and voltage control device that attaches to two large multifunctional electro pads. Position one pad on the anterior part of the chest, usually on the V4 lead position, and the other pad on the back between the spine and the left scapula at the level of the heart. The pads can be used for both pacing and defibrillation. Temporary pacemakers are attached to a program programmable external power source. Patients with temporary or permanent pacemakers will be ECG monitored to evaluate the status of the pacemaker. Pacemaker malfunction primarily involves a failure to sense or failure to capture. Failure to sense occurs when the pacemaker fails to recognize spontaneous atrial or ventricular activity and it fires inappropriately. This can result in the pacemaker firing during the excitable period of the cardiac cycle resulting in VTEC. Failure to sense is called, caused by fibrosis around the tip of the pacing lead, battery failure, sensing set too high, or dislodgement of the electrode. Failure to capture occurs when the electro electrical charge to the myocardium is insufficient to produce atrial or ventricular contraction. This can result in serious bradycardia or asystole. <clears throat> Failure to capture is caused by pacer lead damage, battery failure, dislodgement of electrode, electrical charge set too low, and fibrosis at the electrode tip. Complications of invasive temporary or permanent pacemaker insertion include infection and hematoma formation at the insertion site, pneumothorax, failure to sense or capture, perforation of the atrial or ventricular septum by the pacing lead, and appearance of end-of-life battery power on testing the pacemaker. Several measures can prevent or assess for complications. These include prophylactic IV, antibiotic therapy before and after insertion, 
post-insertion chest x-ray to check lead placement and to rule out the presence of pneumothorax, careful ob observation of insertion site, and continuous ECG monitoring of the patient's rhythm. After the pacemaker has been inserted, the patient can be out of bed once stable. Have the patient limit arm and shoulder activity on the operative side to prevent dislodging the new, newly implanted pacing leads. Observe the insertion site for signs of bleeding and check that the incision is intact. Note any temperature elevation or pain at the insertion site and treat as ordered. Most patients are discharged the next day if stable. Provide patient teaching, which includes Maintain follow-up care with your healthcare provider to begin regular pacemaker function checks. This is often done by interrogating the device using the telephone. Uh, report any signs of infection at the incision site, redness, swelling, drainage, or fever to your healthcare provider immediately. Keep the incision dry for four days after impl implantation or as ordered. Uh, avoid lifting arm on pacemaker side above the shoulder, shoulder until approved by your cardiologist. Avoid direct blows to the pacemaker site. Avoid close proximity to high outlet electric generators as these can interfere with the function of the pacemaker. You should not have a MRI scan unless the pacemaker is approved as MRI safe and there is a protocol in place for patient safety, safety during the procedure. Microwave ovens are safe to use and do not interfere with pacemaker function. Avoid standing near anti-theft devices in doorways and department stores and public libraries. If you should walk through them, walk through them at a normal pace. Travel is not restricted. Just inform security at the airport, train station, or public buildings of the presence of the pacemaker because it may set off the metal detector. If handheld screening wand is used, it should not be directly placed over your pacemaker. Manufacturer information may vary regarding the effect of metal detectors on the function of the pacemaker. Monitor your pulse and inform the healthcare provider if your heart rate drops below a predetermined rate. Carry the pacemaker information card and current list of drugs at all times. Obtain and wear a medical alert device at all times. And consider joining a pacemaker support group, something like on Facebook maybe. Radio frequency catheter ablation therapy uses electrical energy to burn or ablate areas of the conduction system as definitive treatment of tachy dysrhythmias. Ablation therapy is done after EPS has identified the source of the dysrhythmia. An electrode tipped ablation catheter ablates accessory pathways or ectopic sites in the atria, AV node, and ventricles. Catheter ablation is considered the non-pharmacologic treatment of choice for atrial dysrhythmias, resulting in rapid ventricular rates and AV node re-entrant tachycardia refractory to drug therapy. The ablation procedure is a successful therapy with low complication rate. Care of the patient following the ablation therapy is similar to that of the patient undergoing cardiac catheterization. The 12 lead ECG is a major diagnostic tool used to evaluate patients with ACS. The ECG changes are in response to ischemia, injury, or infarction, or necrosis of myocardial cells. The leads facing the area of involvement demonstrate the definitive ECG changes. The leads facing opposite the area involved in the ACS often demonstrate reciprocal ECG changes. In addition, the pattern of ECG changes among the 12 leads provides information on the coronary artery involved in ACS. Typical ECG changes that are seen in myocardial ischemia include ST segment depression and or T wave inversion. ST segment depression is significant if it is at least one small box below the isoelectrical line. Depression of the ST segment and or T wave inversion occurs in response to an inadequate supply of blood and oxygen, which causes an electrical disturbance 
in the myocardial cells. Once treated, the ECG changes will resolve and the ECG will return to the patient's baseline. Myocardial injury represents a worsening stage of ischema that is potentially reversible but may evolve to MI. The typical ECG change seen during injury is ST segment elevation. ST segment elevation is significant if it is greater than or equal to one millimeter above the isoelectric line. If treatment is prompt and effective, it is possible to restore oxygen to the myocardium and avoid or limit infarction. The absence of serum cardiac markers confirms this. Note the dramatic ST segment elevation associated with myocardial injury. A physiologic Q wave is the first negative deflection wave following the P wave. It is normally very short and narrow, as noted in this ECG tracing. Note the deep Q wide Q wave indicating the presence of myocardial infarction. T wave inversion related to MI occurs within hours following the event and may persist for months. The ECG changes seen in injury and MI reflect electrical disturbances in the myocardial cells caused by prolonged lack of blood and oxygen leading to necrosis. In addition to ST segment elevation, a pathologic Q wave may be seen on the ECG in patients with infarction. The Q wave that develops during MI is wide, greater than 0.03 seconds in duration, and deep, greater than or equal to 25% of the height of the R wave. This is referred to as a Q wave MI. The pathologic Q wave may be present on ECG indefinitely. We already did this slide. ECG findings with myocardial infarction normally leads one AVL and V1 to V3 have positive R waves. Note the pathologic Q waves in these leads and the ST segment elevation and leads V2 and V5. Syncope is a brief lapse in consciousness accompanied by loss in posterior tone or fainting. Um, it's common diagnosis of patients coming into the emergency department. The causes of syncope can be cardiovascular or non-cardiovascular. Non-cardiovascular causes vary, but they can include stress, hypoglycemia, dehydration, stroke, and seizure. The most common cause of syncope is cardioneurogenic syncope or vasovagal syncope. Other cardiovascular causes relate to dysrhythmias like tachycardias or bradycardias, prosthetic valve misfunction, pulmonary emboli, and heart failure. A diagnostic workup for a patient with syncope from suspected cardiac cause begins with ruling out structural or ischemic heart disease. This is done with an echocardiography and stress testing. In the older patient who is more likely to have ischemic or structural heart disease, EPS is used to diagnose atrial and ventricular tachydysrhythmias, as well as conduction disturbances causing bradydysrhythmias, all of which can cause syncope. These problems can be treated with antidysrhythmia drug therapy, pacemakers, ICDs, and or catheter ablation therapy. In patients without structural heart disease or in whom EPS testing is not diagnostic, the head-up tilt test may be perform performed. 
Normally, an upright position results in gravity displacing 300 to 800 milliliters of blood to the lower extremities. Specialized nerve, nerve fibers called mechanoreceptors are located throughout the vascular system. These respond to the increased blood volume by starting a reflex increase in sympathetic stimulation and a decrease in parasympathetic output. The end results are slight increase in heart rate and diastolic BP and a slight decrease in systolic BP. In cardioneurogenic syncope, the increase in venous pooling that occurs in upright position reduces venous return to the heart. This results in sudden compensating increase in ventricular contraction. This is mistaken by the brain as hypertensive state and consequently sympathetic stimulation is withdrawn. This produces a paradoxic vacillation and bradycardia, the vasovagal response. The end results are bradycardia, hypotension, cerebral hypoperfusion, and syncope. In the head up tilt test, the patient is placed on a table supported by a belt across the torso and feet. Baseline ECG, BP, and heart rate are obtained in the horizontal position. Next, the table is tilted 60 degrees to 80 degrees and the patient is kept in this upright position for 20 to 60 minutes. ECG and heart rate are recorded continuously and BP is measured every 3 minutes throughout the test. If the patient's BP and heart rate responses are abnormal and clinical symptoms are reproduced, if, meaning if the patient faints, the test is considered positive. If after 30 minutes there is no response, the table is returned to the horizontal position and an IV infusion of low-dose isoproteinol may be started in, its, in an attempt to provoke a response.